Okay, uh, hi. Sorry, I um, nearly didn't make it here this morning because of Cape Town traffic and I missed my flight. So, but I'm here. Well done. Kind of. <laughs> I'm here, but I'm not really here at the same time. Um, so what I want to talk about today essentially is policing. Um, I've only been here a few minutes, but I sense that the room has really discussed policing and its various negative aspects um, in relation to cannabis and the issues and the many forms and examples of um, police brutality and intimidation and corruption and arrest without warrant and arrest um, which is unjustified um, and the list can go on uh, as I'm sure you're all aware and have experienced. So if we think about policing in terms of cannabis there are a variety of aspects. I want to focus on three, one of which is illegal, one of which is policing itself as a form of government, governance and the other is sort of to think about what we can do about this thing. Uh, because the police aren't going to go away, unfortunately. Um, well, actually, fortunately. But I think there's a role that the police can play, um, which some of you will disagree with, and that's okay. Oh my. So, I'll start here, and apologies for those who have seen this picture already. This is one year's worth of arrests for drugs in South Africa weighted by incidents. So, obviously, the bigger the circle, the more incidents that occur. But what I want you to notice, or the thing that is most noticeable, is the vast expanse of arrests. You know, this is very much a national enterprise. It's not something that occurs only in urban areas or only in some places. It occurs everywhere. Now, that obviously is problematic because drugs are ultimately a social issue and you can't really arrest your way out of social issues. But more importantly, there's also an opportunity here. Because if you look at that map, we see that SAPS, in terms of as a government department, has more reach and more resources than anyone else. So if we are antagonistic towards the police and we don't work with the police, the result is that you have a nationwide network of people who are going to arrest you and limit you. Whereas if there is the potential to arrest, to work with people or work with the police, that's one. Is that my one? That's my one. <laughs> if we work with the police, there is a potential to have a nationwide network and infrastructure which no other government department has. Frankly, social development just doesn't have the capacity. The Department of Health doesn't have the money. The police do, though. The trick then is to find a way of reconfiguring policing in this country so as that it is of utility, but it also reflects societal concerns. And that's the key issue, I think. So, so, I think that some of this is going to be covered. I'm just going to cover it quickly, purely for interest sake. There is essentially a regulatory environment in South Africa that touches on drugs and cannabis specifically. Um, on the one hand, we have SAFRA, which I'll talk about, because SAFRA seems to be quite a <laughs> difficult phenomenon at the best of times. We have SAPS, Violent Drugs and Drugs Trafficking Act. Uh, we have DOH, um, DOCS Docs, um, and others which are relate to all of this in some or other way, uh, and we have DSD, who even have their own law, the Prevention and Treatment for Substance Abuse Act, which is very minor in comparison to the Drugs and Drugs Trafficking Act, even though it's a lot larger. Uh, and then we have the National Drug Master Plan, which will eventually one day be released. <laughs> one day. Um, I've, got, I've got the unreleased version, and it's quite good, but does anyone, has, is anyone from the CDA here? Does anyone know who, who what the CDA are? The Central Drug Authority. Have you heard of the CDA? Okay, last time I asked that question at this conference, in Cape Town no one had. Okay. The, the reason I ask it is because the CDA should be the, the body that arranges and organizes all of these things. But unfortunately the CDA is a sub-department of the Department of Social Development and thus it doesn't have that much power, nor impact because a lot of people haven't even heard of it. In fact, I often ask police officers who I work with quite a lot, have they heard of the CDA or the National Drug Master Plan? Very few answer yes to either of those questions. Very few. So we have at least in, in principle a framework for governing something like cannabis or medicines, uh, whatever form they take. But the reality in South Africa is that the regulatory environment is primarily enforced and enacted through the police. If we think about drugs in this country, we think about policing. We don't think about healthcare. So why is that? Why is it that the police are at the forefront of the way in which we both think about drugs, but also the way in which we regulate them? 
And you know, do we can we expect any other outcome but arrests if that's the primary way in which we understand these things? And I assume we as society. I mean, obviously, you know, society changes, but in general, this is the idea. So to go through the legal framework, which we've just gone through, so I'll be very, very brief. Um, obviously, consenting adults, 18 or older, may use, possess, and cultivate cannabis in private for their own consumption. What that means, of course, <laughs> is subject to vast amounts of debate. Um, why 18? I'm not sure. I mean, I know 18 is like a legal framework, but what is, is a person really different from when they're 17 years old and then suddenly they're 18? No, not at all. Okay? And why 18? It's completely arbitrary. Um, and like, which is, I mean, sort of like most law, in fact. Quite arbitrary. <laughs> but um, uh, we can debate that another time. Uh, consumption may not occur in public, obviously. What, what is the public and private sphere? Because this is something that applies to domestic violence and gender-based violence as well. In South Africa, the distinction between what is public and private is not that easy to make. Think about, so in, for instance, we're doing some work in Cape Town uh, in Bishop, at Bishop Labus, and there a lot of people have houses, and they have a family living in one house, and then they'll have people living in smaller houses in the, on the same property. So now, is that domestic sphere, that, uh, that I don't know, earth, a public or a private space? How do you police that? Do you charge people under public or private law? What is consumption in that instance? Is someone who's consuming on a property they don't own, but in a residence that they rent, private? Well, it's not that easy to distinguish, especially in terms of the law, which is something police should enforce. Um, now, what about non-consenting adults? How do you know the difference between, who, how do you consent? Do you have to verbally consent? Do you have to give written consent to this occur? How do you, how do you <laughs> charge, like, how do you re-invoke this at another time? I mean, if you go to court about this, could you say, no, I didn't actually consent? And if it was only verbal consent, who's going to know? How can you prove this? So there's a lot of issues here. Um, and of course, use of possession by anyone else. Um, it's very vague, to put it bluntly. The scheduling system, and I'll get, this is related to SARPRO, which is a far more interesting thing, um, is around THC uh, and the percentage zero. Now, I can tell you that the only way to determine the THC content of something is to do a forensic analysis of it. In South Africa, there is a supply chain concern that is affecting forensics in terms of police that prevents this type of analysis from occurring. So if you arrest someone and you put them into a waiting trial or whatever, you know, they're found in possession and therefore um, de facto at least a waiting trial, what hap how do, and you can't analyze the stuff that you're basing this whole detention on, what do you do? Because you can't analyze. But the difference is not only that it's not, it is possible to analyze, but in terms of policing and forensics, it's that the supply chain has fallen apart, so that's the reason you end up staying in prison. But is that a legal reason to hold someone in detention? Oh no, our supply chain is broken. You can't hold people in detention for that. So there's a question, you know, what do we do? If you think about other drugs, um, there's an even larger issue that, so for instance, take cocaine for instance, about, normally in Cape Town at least it's about 10% pure. The rest of it's talcum powder. Now, in terms of the Drugs Act, you are obviously committing a crime if you're in possession of cocaine. But are you committing a crime if you're in possession of talcum powder? No. So what about, so if you spend 10 years, just for argument's sake, for one gram of coke, and only 10% of it's pure, that means you spend nine years in jail for nine grams of talcum powder. Is that just? Can we expect the police to make such a distinction in the first place? No, because they enforce the law. CBD is another whole area of concern. Um, obviously, it's got percentages, 20 milligrams. Uh, it was a one, I don't know if they still do it. One of the pizza chains were putting it in pizza. Do they still do that? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. How, how are you gonna verify this stuff? Like, you know, like, law has to have a practical application, especially in terms of policing, because that is who the, at the sharp end of who is enforcing a law. Now, how is a police officer gonna determine if they walk into Guido's or whoever it is, Calcaccio's, whether there is 20 milligrams of CBD in that pizza. Or they could do a forensic analysis, but that takes two weeks from 10,000 Rand, and you have to have a supply chain that works. It's not gonna happen. So there's no pragmatic way of doing this thing called cannabis in terms of policing at the moment. And this is where it enters into a dangerous territory because when there is no real way of doing something, there's discretion. And we'll talk about discretion in a second, but discretion can be very dangerous. Um, it can also be an opportunity for good work to be done. So I want to talk about SARPRA. 
Now, I obviously haven't been here this morning, but SAPRA is for me at least one of the critical points at which the complexity and problems of cannabis regulation and licensing occurs in this country right now. I don't have the answers about what SAPRA does or is any more than anyone else does because I, I can't figure it out that well. But I can, however, read kind of, and I can take from the amendments uh, to the NCC and for the um, Control Council bill. These were the amendments that they put in place to introduce SAPRA. Now, you know, Parliament is up to something dodgy when essentially it gets passed very quietly. Does anyone remember when SAPRA got passed? <laughs> it, just, it just happened. You know Parliament up to something dodgy when that happens because it's always, every time there's a very quiet piece of legislation put through it, it's always dodgy. So, the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority hereby established an organ of state within the public administration but outside the public service. What does that mean? So, established as an organ of state, which means it has regulatory power because it's an organ of state, but outside of the public service. What's outside of the public service in terms of law? The private. This is a company, but a company with the authority of state. So now if you have an organ of government which is for all intents and purposes and functioning a company that is profit driven but has the, the regulatory power of government at state, you have a, potentially a very big problem because you suddenly have a profit driven organization that has the power to enforce its own structures and dynamics to generate more income. Uh, and this is sort of, there's sort of a little telltale to this that hints at why this, well, why this is true at least. So, a member of the board excluding members, blah, 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 with the concurrence of the Minister of Finance. What does the Minister of Finance have to do with the regulation of medicines and health things? I mean, if this was just about health and medicine, what does the Minister of Finance have to do with this? Does the South African state make medicine? At a broad scale, does it have, is it like Cipra or someone? Or Merck? No. So why does the Minister of Finance have to be involved? Unless, of course, it is actually a profit-driven thing, and the Minister of Finance has something to do with this, because this is a, this is a grand little stream of, of income in a country where tax compliance is quite low, among other things. Of course, it makes a problem, there's the problem on the other side as well. So I know you establish yourself, you know, you come to this country and you've got a product Let's call it heroin. Okay, well, just for argument's sake. And you give it to the people in software and they do tests and they discover this stuff is quite addictive and probably quite problematic to, you know, like disseminate. So we're gonna make it schedule eight. But you say, hang on. Schedule eight is gonna limit my distribution. Because I can't distribute, in other words, unless it's you know like through dodgy channels. I want to schedule three. Well, how, how, is it going to, how can we make that happen? Well, we can make that happen because if Sapra is a profit-driven country, company, and we are big farmer who happens to have a lot of money, well, we can afford to do that. So what, you, what occurs essentially is that health concerns and medical concerns become subject to the licensing frameworks that are established purely on affordability or <laughs> on expense, which means, and it hasn't happened yet, I do put that, I want to put that caveat in, but it, the potential legally is there for people who may not have the best interests of other people in mind, but may have the best interests of profit in mind, to fundamentally influence the process by which licensing and scheduling occurs to such an extent that things that are dangerous may be scheduled at lower levels. And vice versa, think of cannabis, for instance, that doesn't have the money, but has the potential to do good, can't get their thing scheduled at the right level. So you end up with cannabis being remaining, you know, so I mean, yes, you can have your private consumption, but anything commercial is scheduled five, six, maybe four if you're lucky, because you don't have the money to influence that decision, well then you just undermine a whole lot of good that could come out of cannabis. Now I'm not saying it's happened, but I'm not saying it's not gonna happen either. I mean, I don't wanna be skeptical of government, but um, <laughs> history, history, history uh, leads me to want to be skeptical. So there's a lot of there's a lot of confusion around software. I mean, this is just the big picture. There's a lot of legal confusion. There's a lot of regulatory confusion. There's a lot of access confusion. And I don't have the answers to how this is going to be sorted out. But I do question why did we change from the MCC in the first place? 
Medical Control Council was run by doctors. Why did we need software? I don't know. No one listens to me anyway. So, Jenny, it's because there are a whole lot of health related products that sort of have one person a medical thing and another puts in a sort of sure. health and it's meant to bridge that divide and not be purely a medical thing. I agree. I don't, I don't see why doctors couldn't, wouldn't be also the best people to ask them. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I mean, we could expand it into because also when software came into being at a very pragmatic level, there was this issue that they kind of kicked well, turfed the MCC out of the offices, and I mean, this cost a lot of money. They got rid of all these people, put new people in, and there was an administrative black backlog and confusion that occurs to this day. Asking software what software does is quite dangerous sometimes, at least in my experience. I mean, if anyone from software here, I'm, uh, my apologies, but this is my experience. Um, it shouldn't be like that. Then again, if you ask the traffic department, I think it's a similar concern. But, so, policing in, occurs in this space, and this space is a confused and somewhat difficult space at the best of times. SAPS issued a directive to, when the law changed, which we've all heard about, SAPS issued a directive trying to instruct police members what to do about this. Um, and there are key issues that they didn't know how to deal with, and I think still need to be dealt with. And one is, Quantity, which we can debate till the cows come home, yeah? Is six kilograms or 600 grams a legitimate use? Well, it depends who you are. It depends what you're doing with it, and it depends how much you smoke, frankly. Um, private spaces, again, very, very con contestable. What constitutes a private space in South Africa? I don't know. In the same way, a public space. Is this a private space? If we're all consenting here, but would everyone be consenting? Wouldn't there be a lot of peer pressure to be consenting? So even if you did consent or didn't consent, would you actually say it in public? Probably not. So it's not that simple. Um, I don't know what the answers are. I'm just telling you what questions are. And discretion itself is not the final. Discretion in South African policing is difficult to engage with because on the one hand, it empowers police to make decisions which are both systematically empowers them to be better police officers, but equally allows for the police to encounter differences in law and you know, complexities in law. On the other hand, it also can allow police to be influenced by the 50 rand in the glove pocket, so is that their discretion is, you know, sort of shaped for them. Much like Sarkar, actually. Um, <laughs> and it, so, I mean, the whole idea, at least in the police directive, we're going to base this on loosely empirical understandings, you know, and, it's, and this is a sort of quote from verbatim here, immediate evidence derived from the five senses. What happens if you can't hear or see or something? I don't know, maybe you're not in the police, but you have to have five senses to do this, which is again a questionable thing, because not everyone has five senses or good five senses. I can't see. Does that make me now, I can't rely on my sense of sight. Can I then have discretion? Who knows? Um, but there is a point here. If there's any doubt, members must not arrest, and I, this is straight from the director, SAP's director, but they should register a criminal case file and ensure a suspect appears in court via sound. This is a problem because the whole thing, no matter what happens, even if it's a good outcome, even if the police pitch up at the door, do the search, which they're not supposed to do, and by virtue of discretion say, well, actually, I can't figure out whether this is good or bad or illegal or illegal, but I'm going to refer this. The referral itself goes into the criminal justice system. So we've never escaped the very thing, the whole debate and the whole legal framework and the change thereof was supposed to escape in the first place, is that drugs and cannabis are not a criminal justice matter. But we haven't. So even at the point at which we think we're escaping, we just suck back into the criminal justice system. And the criminal justice system is overloaded, <laughs> minimally. Polls was 157%. You can't put any more people in jail. And putting people in jail does nothing, especially for drugs, any drug. You can't cure people by arresting them. And you can't fix social problems by trying to arrest everyone, ever. <laughs> anyway, but this is, this is so the point is here is that We've got to be careful because even when we think we've, we've done something, we've changed the law, the law, well, the change actually just reinvokes the very thing we're trying to escape from in the first place, which is the criminal justice system. For good reason. There's no reason, there's no reason why cannabis should have anything to do with the criminal justice system. They just shouldn't. And frankly, the criminal justice system should have better things to do. You know, like <laughs> domestic violence, gender-based violence, murder, rape, whatever. The list is endless of crimes in this country. So how do we understand this sort of at a contextual level? How, what can we do? So if you look at the scale, a lot of people seem to think criminalization and legalization is a binary. You know, you're either for legalization or by de facto not, and therefore criminalization. I get this a lot because I sit in the middle. And 
people seem to say, oh, so you don't, oh, so you, you don't think people should be thrown in jail for drugs. You must do drugs, obviously. But it doesn't work like that at all. Um, we have, for the, la for the last 40 years or so, sort of been flirting with ultra-prohibition with, with drugs in general. And other than alcohol and, can and tobacco, which kill more people than anything else, and far more harmful than anything else. But nonetheless, those were allowed. But ultra-prohibition has been our sort of default standard. We're entering into a sort of legal regulatory sphere at the moment. But the problem is, of course, we don't really know what we're doing. And I think the sense is that we're too... <laughs> People are too scared to push it, they put on the gas and say, okay, let's just do this and do it properly. People are, you know, there's, there's always that back, people in the back of people's minds, are we doing something wrong? Because drugs are evil and cannabis might just be a drug. And therefore, we're going to demoralize society or something. But it doesn't have to be that way. And we can move all the way to commercial pro, pro, um, promotion. I don't know if we're going to get there in the next 10 years, but maybe one day. I think at the moment, the best we can hope for is some sort of licensing regulatory sphere and for, you know for private consumption cannabis clubs and the like as a means of engaging with this issue but the point here at least i want to show is that it doesn't have to be yes or no or legal or illegal there is a whole range of places or positions we can occupy in between those things and people because we oversimplify this whole thing and think of it as a sort of prohibition versus legalization debate we we eradicate the nuance that could exist and there are a variety of positions that actually have solutions to our concerns that we just got to think about a little more clearly and sort of suspend our normative frameworks around drugs. Drugs in general, but cannabis specifically. No. I think drugs don't make you a bad person. Drugs are not a criminal justice issue. But it's very hard to convince police otherwise. So, understanding policing, we need to understand in this country a lot of people ask, where do the police get their mandate from? Where do, what, why do the police do these things? Well, they get their mandate from two places. One is political concern. There's political pressure on the top for them to believe certain things. Think about gangs in the Western Cape. Yeah, lots of people die. There's a lot of high-profile murders. Eventually, such generals go, you need to sort this thing out. We're going to send in the military, y'all, because that's going to sort it out. Like, let's just, you know, use bigger guns to fight guns. Obviously, that's the solution. But that didn't work, by the way, again. <laughs> But there's also public pressure, and I think this is something that is very much not spoken about. There's a lot of public pressure for the police to arrest things we conceive of as bad. Communities, and when, when you speak to communities, and you talk about gangs, for instance, on the Cape Flats, they say, the police must come. Because that's what they believe is going to sort out the problem, the police. So there's a lot of public pressure for, these, for the police to do something. But the problem, of course, is that we're asking a state organization that's not, or well, shouldn't be dealing with these problems, to deal with the problems. And you're using the biggest hammer the state has got to hit the very smallest nails. And what happens? Nails get bent all the time. People end up in jail <laughs> and lives are destroyed. But that's, it. that's why we are here, essentially, in terms of the police. Is that the police can be changed, but there needs to be public pressure for that change to occur. You know, it's one thing to say in a conflict like this, oh, the police need to change. But it's another to convince your neighbors that cannabis isn't the evil that a lot of people have been brought up to think it is. And that's the only way policing will change. But, so policing perspective essentially can be understood as focus and mandate and performance. And performance is something I want to talk about for a lot. So let's talk about discretion quickly. So what is discretion? It's a free choice to decide within any given situation by a police officer that you may they may encounter what to do, which way to go. Now this can be discretion in terms of not accepting or accepting a bribe, which I sense might be something for German Metro, please. Anyone from the German Metro here? <laughs> 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 So, <laughs> not that I'm saying that bribery is right within that organization. Um, I, I just leave it at that. But the point is, so I mean, whether, whether a person is arrested or not, whether a person is dealt with more harshly or not, whether a person happens to hit their head five times when entering the police van rather than just being put in it, these are aspects of discretion. Now, in South Africa, what the police have tried to do, because there is so much confusion about the cannabis bill and cannabis regulation decrow at the moment, They've tried to bind this with the only thing they've got, which is prima facie evidence. <coughs> I.e. what you see, smell, hear, touch, and... I don't know, what the five senses are, taste. These are the things that you must base your discretion on. I.e. don't think, just because this guy's got dreadlocks, that he must therefore be a rasta and must have tons of weed on him, <laughs> and therefore must be arrested. 
again. <laughs> that, that discretion based on presupposition about religious and, and, you know, sort of religious background and cannabis consumption is not legitimate. And at least, the I mean, strength of the police, that's a, good, that's a good thing to say. You know, you can't just say by virtue of assuming something that you can erase, erase people on that basis. But of course it's more complicated than that because, I mean, presupposing you've got all five senses, of course. You know, how do you then base it? So, I mean, the, the police have tried to make their own little bill, their own, their own version of events to try to define what policing and the operational logic of policing cannabis would look like. And they've come up with a very detailed plan, but it's so detailed that, for instance, they've suggested that if, can, if someone is smoking cannabis, but there needs to be a certain amount of airflow through the room. And if there's a certain amount of airflow, then it's legit. But if it's not, then it's not. How are you going to determine that? There's enough airflow in this room. <laughs> I mean, do they need now these lot of airflow, you know, those things with a little propeller on it? Well, you first have to remove all the plants in the garden and inside. Well, yeah, exactly, because that just... Cannabis, and then you'll find some it's there. horrendously complicated, and it's never going to happen because the police just don't have the time, mandate, or training to do this. Now, I know there's anyone else, frankly. Um, it's just not going to work. But that's sort of, you know, the wrong way down the path, rather than basic principles. And we should also remember that policing discretion is made by humans, and humans and police are not divorced from the context in which they live. Police are people, we hope, and they are influenced by the same concerns that we all are influenced by. They don't just grow up in a vacuum. Training doesn't insulate into that. So if lots of people, if, if societal perceptions of something are bad, um, I'm trying to think of something, uh, Satanism, the police perceptions of this thing is going to be bad. So they see upside down cross, how this, this, I mean, no pun intended, but this is going to be an issue. But that's because their perceptions are influenced by the context in which they live. And in cannabis, it's especially important because drugs and the perceptions around drugs in South Africa are quite strong. People are like vehemently against this thing. Not so much cannabis anymore, but drugs in general. I mean, like cocaine or heroin is like, what? This is bad stuff. So obviously, police are going, to, are going to be influenced to the extent that their discretion will be swayed or at least foregrounded by concerns around or understandings of drugs as bad. So what are they going to do? They're going to hurt the people. They're going to enforce the law in a very strict manner because they think this thing is bad. So we've got to remember that, that our perceptions and the wider perceptions of a topic, whether it be cannabis, whether it be pornography, or whatever it be, I don't know, whatever, corruption, the police are not insulated from this. Their perceptions count, and their perceptions when it comes to discretion are incredibly important because they inform discretion. So and how do we stop this? Well, we need really good training, frankly. Uh, at the moment, SAP spends more on litigation than it does on training. So the, you know, the concern is, well, maybe we should spend more money on training and then the litigation will occur, but there needs to be a lot more substance. But also societal perceptions need to change, and I think that's something none of us can actually manipulate or force, but equally, it's changing. The views on cannabis have changed. I mean, the Dacher couple. <laughs> the Dacher couple. You know, like, this is like the way in which things have changed. Before, I mean, imagine that was 20 years ago. It wouldn't, wouldn't have been articulated that way. It would have been the sinners from Jogo. <laughs> but so perceptions are changing and police perceptions are changing. So the, the, the opportunity to do something different is here. And that's what I want to emphasize. It's not all doom and gloom. Um, and this is the key point here, is that policing of drugs is much a means of giving expression to control of defined populations, who we think do drugs, as it is about limiting the availability of substance. We don't just police substances. We police the type of people we think do those substances. And in South Africa, that's incredibly dangerous because we happen to live in very divided, very contextually and, and spatially defined communities. So, and I'll show you in a minute, if, for instance, we assume that colored men do methamphetamine, that means colored men will be infinitely more policed and arrested infinitely more, which is a problem. If we assume that rasters use a lot more cannabis and cannabis is evil, then that's an easy target especially when it comes to performance, which is the next topic. So how do we understand performance? Every year in South Africa, we have the crime stats are released. And there's normally, normally drugs are put right at the end as a success, not last year because the process didn't go up. But people understand policing success as a numerically and quantitative phenomenon. In other words, the more people you arrest on a subject, the better the police are doing about this thing. Let's take drugs as an example. If you arrest more people for, for drug charges, is that indicative 
of you having a hold on the problem? Is that an indic indicative of success? Not at all. What it's indicative of is you arresting more people. That's it. Because we know arresting people for drugs does not fix drugs. It doesn't stop them making, doing drugs, making drugs, or anything else. What it does is put people in jail who then encounter the number and gangs and stuff and become far, far more dangerous. So the very concept, the parameter, the, the, the ideal which we hold the police by and which we define as policing success is in of itself actually a failure. And I use the word drugs here, but cannabis is included in this moment for policing terms. So that's a big problem. And that is a key to changing this entire system because the police are not going to stop policing when they are poorly paid and they need to meet their targets, or the station needs to meet their targets so that they can go home and get a, get, you know, a bonus and a wage increase so that they can continue feeding their families. We can't expect the police to just stop arresting people that are doing cannabis when it's in that framework. Because the key performance index, or indicator there, is arrest. So we need to change that, because if you change that, people will stop being arrested for stupid things, frankly. And it's very easy to change. We can, we can for instance, we can include diversion programs, so for other drugs, not cannabis, because we really need diversion, but instead of counting arrest as a one point, we could have diversion. Did you divert this person? Yes? Okay, one point. It counts towards your success. But in the present context, it doesn't. Nothing but arrest counts as success, and that's a key problem. Because we're demanding from the police that they do the very thing that is the most damaging thing in terms of policing of drugs and gangs and domestic violence and all sorts of things. Um, so where did the mandate come from? Well, we discussed this. political pressure, public pressure. So the point here is that the conversation needs to begin with us, with society, as to what we want from the police. Demanding that every time we have a social problem, that the police go in there and arrest people is not the solution and we will continue to have a variety of social problems so long as we demand that that occurs. Frankly. <coughs> Gangsterism is another example. You can't use bigger guns against the gangs because they're just going to get bigger guns. Probably stolen from the South African Defence Force. <laughs> In fact, likely stolen from the South African Defence Force. But the point is you can't, you can't make peace by bringing guns to a gunfight. You just make more guns. You can't solve violence with more violence, frankly. So how do we see, how, how does it, what does this sort of cash out as? Well, and I'm nearly done, alright. Um, if we look at the number of arrests so since from that 10 year period, that they've grown up and they keep on going up every year other than last year. But I mean, SAPS has mandated for the next 10 years to increase their drug arrests by 27%. So we'll see what happens this year. But the, the arrests have continually gone up. Is this indicative of them getting a handle on the problem? Or is it indicative of more people doing drugs and just more people to arrest? And if more people are doing, are doing more drugs and yet we're arresting more people, what does that say about our solution to the problem? It's not only not working, perhaps it's driving the problem in the first place. So we look at the number of people that are treated for drugs in general, we find it's very static. Very, a very minor percent, and it's very flat. I mean, like, it's the same amount every year. So if we take the ratio, in other words, we, we deduct the two from each other, what you get is a decreasing ratio. Now this is against, this is an exact opposition to international best practice, frankly. You want to treat more people as you do want to arrest people. Arresting people doesn't solve anything, it's a temporary thing. If you want to solve drugs, well, treating is one, and even that is can be dodgy, but the point is it's better than arresting people at least. So we're doing the exact opposite to what we should be doing. And we can see this. So if you take all the drug-related crimes in certain, in certain suburbs of Cape Town, I'll just use an example, and you take the total and then the, the number of drug arrests, and the red light is sort of the percentage of the ratio between the two, okay? Now what you find is very white suburbs, you know, very like touristy places. And we move our way towards non-touristy places that happen to be on the Cape Flats. What do you find? Drug arrests go up and up and up. I mean, obviously it's fluctuation, but they go up. Now, does that mean that, more, that people in the Cape Flats, I mean, people in Camps Bay don't do drugs? <laughs> <laughs> and only people in Delft do drugs? Also, because remember, our society is very much fragmented and stratified by race. Doesn't mean that white people don't do drugs and only colored people do drugs? No. What it means 
is that you take a hundred white people, you take a hundred colored people, and you only dig in the pockets of the colored people, and you only find drugs on them because you only dug in pockets of their, theirs, <laughs> what are you going to find? You're going to find that colored people do more drugs. But that's not true. It's not true in the sense that actually that's what's occurring. What's occurring, rather, is that you're justifying your stats by doing the very thing that you're basing the justification on. You're reinforcing the falsity of the distinction in the first place. And if you look at the arrest ratios for race in this country, you find that far more people of color are arrested than any other, more so than the, major the difference in population size. Far more. So what is the result, statistically? White people don't do drugs. Frankly, bullshit. No. It's that you never arrested anyone in the first place. You never bothered to look. Why? Because there's a whole conception about who does drugs and what. If I say, you know, I do some undergrads. If I say, who does methamphetamine? The general stereotypical understanding, like the person who comes to mind. Most people say a coloured man. I mean, the cake up. Who does heroin? White Old white people. Who does nyope? Yes. Young black people. Which is worth, heroin or nyope? They're the same damn thing, frankly. <laughs> But there's a difference in the way in which we arrest people and therefore a difference in our perception of where, who we are. And that perception is reinforcing. So if police officers keep arresting people of colour, their perception of who is the criminal is warped. Which influences their discretion. And it's just, it's called a negative feedback loop. It just goes worse and worse and worse and worse. And that's where we are at the moment. Uh, <laughs> possibly, but uh, that could be a dodge as well. Um, so, I think, you know, how do we understand this all? Police enforce the law. That's what their job is. They enforce the law. And yes, the police in South Africa don't just enforce their law. They are often doctors. They are often paramedics. They are often fulfilling a role or a vast array of social roles. And that is key because we don't reward police on any of those things. We only reward them on how many people they arrest, which is a problem because they're not recognized for all the good they do as well, frankly. There's also significant challenges. And I know saying SAPs has got resource limitations is kind of weird considering how much of the budget they get, but they do. Because we keep demanding that the police do something about all of our social problems. We don't think, well, maybe we need to figure out why people are doing drugs in impoverished areas. Well, maybe it's in poverty that's an issue, surely. You know? Has anyone thought about this? Like, maybe poverty is a good reason to do drugs it's because of life sucks? No, but it's just arresting. Police officers don't operate in a vacuum, they're influenced by the way in which we understand things. And police officers are significantly traumatized. Well, the whole of the cyber population is traumatized to an extent, but police officers specifically, because they deal with the most horrendous things possible. You know when you read about some baby fell down into a pit toilet or something, who do you think goes down and get that, gets that fetus's body? A police officer. And is there any recourse, is there any psychological help here? Nothing. I mean, on paper there is, but it doesn't work out in reality. Also because of very masculinized discourse. So, you know, it's all about being real men, or being a man, so you don't look for help. Because, you know, mental illness is not a disease, apparently. There's also a lot of police scapegoating, and this is a function of us warping the mandate. You know, we, we blame the police for a whole lot of things. We blame the police for drugs, in general. Why the hell haven't you arrested the whole damn lot of people, even if that means arresting everyone in the country in some extent? Well, you can't arrest your way out of this problem, so actually we're telling the police why haven't you do your job, but it's not their job in the first place. You can't use the police to fix social problems. They should be the last resort, not the first. And that's the problem in this country, I think, is that they've often become the first for everything. <laughs> they do. Um, there's a lot of drugs in the police. Um, and, this, and, and this undermines their police legitimacy, and it's key to this type of arena. When we think of the police, we laugh about it. Yeah? We don't respect the police. Often in my undergrad course was full of American students who want to come like study crime in Africa. And <laughs> you know, but they when I asked them, if you got into trouble, who do you run to? No, I'll go to the police. Ask a South African, would you run to the police if you were in trouble? I will. No chance in hell. But, but that's a, that, it's it's funny, but it's also scary because the police are ultimately the people who we should be able to feel have our backs, but they, it may not, they may actually often have our backs, but we, we're too scared to go ask them for help. Because there's, there's concerns around legitimacy and there's concerns around arrest, but that's a function of our very demand. Why do you think they keep doing this? Why do you think they keep arresting everyone for the stupidest things? Well, that's because their, their performance targets are arrest-based. You want to fix these, fix their performance metrics, frankly. 
And the result is that we have these very antagonistic responses to police. <coughs> and that, I'm afraid to say, may be one of the biggest limitations that the cannabis community as a whole will encounter and has to deal with. Is that because, remember the first slide I said you, showed you? The police have the largest network in South Africa. The police have the most resources. And the police can offer the most support if we can get it right. But because a lot of debates and a lot of engagements are antagonistic, that relationship won't ever come about. And it's very hard, I know it's very hard to not be antagonistic when you've been arrested and thrown in jail and messed around with a million times. I know it's very hard. It's only happened to me a little bit, but it's happened to me. But unless we get engaged with them in a manner that is sustainable and supportive, and that doesn't mean we have to be like, you know, like just roll over. We can be critical, but critical in a justified manner. We are missing out on an opportunity to do a lot of good or to have a lot of help. Not only just in the hiatus of arrests, but in the support that they can offer in terms of resources and stuff. I mean, think about diversion. Who else is going to take someone who's being diverted from their place of doing drugs to a rehabilitation center? No one but the police, because no one else has got vehicles, frankly. Um, and policing mindsets do change. They're not, again, they're influenced by society. And you know, if we can influence people in a way that is positive, well, the police can be, they can be influenced too, for good. But that means not being antagonistic, but explaining and making a case for why these things are bad. But it also means you know, saying to the police, well, you can't say the police don't arrest people when their performance metrics are arrest-based. So it needs to be a more hol holistic uh, conversation. And that is mandated by us, the public, ultimately. So I think collaboration and inclusion is possible. And it would be very scary if, we, if cannabis manages to, as a movement, not include the police at all, because there's always going to be this issue around arrest and antagonism. And every time, I mean, it's easy to put in law and say there must be no antagonism, but I guarantee you, if you're smoking a split on the street corner and the, and the police drive past and there hasn't been some decent conversation around that, they're going to be people being, their heads are going to be bashed against the police van door, because they can. So there needs to be that conversation. And I think it's possible. In fact, I know it's possible. But it means allowing for other perspectives as well, which I think is important. You know, we can't expect, expect other people to change their opinions about cannabis unless we are willing to engage with people who don't have the same opinions as us. I think that's it. Thank you.